So hello everybody. I'm looking very much forward to this uh, presentation of uh, ADEF, which is a, a network node in the Amber Network Festival uh, that is happening uh, now until May in um, uh, Berlin and uh, around the world uh, online in many places. And um, yeah, the stage is yours. Hello, uh, I'm Ranwa Yahya, and uh, I want to very excited about uh, uh, presenting within these uh, specific tracks as well. Um, ADIF um, is an organization that started in 2005 and has been working on the intersection between media, arts, and technology um, within a framework of learning ever since. And this process in its many alterations year after year has continued to develop and involve and also continue to engage with younger and younger generations. And um, we're very happy to feel that at the stage, what we are experimenting in here in Cairo, along with many other Arab uh, young artists and techies and professionals from different Arab countries and also from the world, um, it's very exciting to see that we're sort of experimenting and playing along the same levels as those in Europe or in the States. And um, we are uh, excited about uh, engaging uh, uh, further as well with, you know, you know we have out of Egypt and out of Lebanon and now out of Berlin. And um, I will leave the introduction of out of Berlin to uh, my colleague Laura. And um, looking forward to uh, hear about the, the presentations of our uh, guests. Thank you, Ranwa. Uh, so, hello everyone. My name is Laura Kuhuzi and I have been working with ADEF Berlin in curating a series of events and conversations, bringing together media professionals, um, journalists and digital artists and developers in the Arabic speaking regions to discuss some of the urgent, some of the most urgent challenges that new technologies introduce in uh, journalism and in media production. So we. Uh, asked invited speakers to share their experience and their background and to explore together how tech tools inform the content of the stories they want to tell, but also vice versa, how the story drives the choice of medium and, and creative tools. And ADEF's approach has always been one of collaboration and focus on the process and on learning. So we hope that being exposed to different practices and people operating in different but adjacent fields can enrich each other's work. So we're interested in speaking also to different audiences, how it influences the direction of of the, um, the stories we, we are exploring. So we invited uh, Alessandro Bertelle and Yasmin Layat. Alessandro is a game designer and uh, director and he will speak about his, uh, his background and his practice. Uh, and Yasmin Layat uh, will present also her work and then we can have a, a conversation uh, afterwards and feel free to ask questions and post the questions on, uh, on the chat and uh, we were looking forward to your contributions. So welcome, Yasmin. Uh, go ahead. All right. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, all right. So I'm going to get started and share my screen and kick us off today. Thank you for having me. OK, great. Um, All right, so um, let's see, making sure it's working great. Okay, um, so hi everybody. Um, my name is uh, Yasmin Alayat and I am uh, uh, based in Brooklyn, New York. And 
I am an artist, I'm an immersive director, and I'm also a co-founder of a company called Scatter, um, which is sort of where a lot of my work and practice is right now. And um, what Scatter is, is we're an immersive uh, company, creative company, um, and we are creating this genre of immersive media that we're calling volumetric filmmaking. And what volumetric filmmaking is, is essentially the marriage between gaming and filmmaking. So it's about leveraging the power and flexibility of, of the game engine with the craft and sensibility of filmmaking. And um, basically our approach is about uh, featuring real people and real stories and real places that are volumetrically captured inside of 3D worlds that we construct. Um, and what this allows us to do is create um, room scale immersive experiences where you can walk around through the environment where the stories actually take place and you can interact with the characters and feel their presence. And it feels as um, immersive as our real world. Um, and we believe this is a, to tell stories that can't not be told in any other way. And for us, this is sort of the future for immersive media. And um, we have uh, a body of award-winning work that we've premiered across film festivals. Um, Clouds was one of our first at 2014, a Sundance. And um, uh, I'll talk about some of these other projects today, so I won't get too much into them. But a lot of the work is focused on um, documentary or nonfiction, and it's usually related to um, important topics and, and news and, and current events that we are living through. So it's it's a reaction to sort of the, the lived in experience in the world we're, we're in today. Um, and so I'm going to start with um, an example of, of um, you know, some examples of our work. And I'm going to start with this project, which I directed um, and produced uh, called Zero Days VR. And um, Zero Days VR is a uh, immersive documentary, uh, virtual reality documentary, that's an adaptation of a feature film that's by the same name, Zero Days, which was directed by Alex Gibney. And uh, Zero, Zero Days tells the story of the Stuxnet virus, which is the first cyber weapon that we know of in history that can cause real world physical destruction. And um, in our, like in this adaptation, the idea was where, how do you make a documentary where your lead character is a piece of code and where code could speak for itself? And so in Zero Days VR, the story of Stuxnet comes to life in a very new way from the perspective of an implanted virus. Um, and so in this experience, you, you experience the invisible world of cyber warfare through the perspective of Stuxnet on its mission to sabotage um, Iran's nuclear program. And you find yourself embedded in these immersive digital worlds and in the intangible world of code. You travel to Natanz, which is a heavily protected underground nuclear facility where you, uh, where Stuxnet um, sabotages Iranian centrifuges and it causes real world physical destruction. And so Zero Days is a very visceral experience about the high stakes of, um, of cyber war on a very human scale. Um, I'm going to switch to the trailer, um, but I need to little virtual DJings here for one. Give me one moment while I switch over um, and share the video momentarily. It's a covert operation. Maybe you don't know as much as you think you know. Here is a piece of software that should only exist in the cyber realm and it is able to cause real-world physical destruction. Stuxnet wasn't just an evolution. It was really a revolution in the threat landscape. Everyone's getting this story wrong, and we have to get it right. The stakes are too high. We are the most vulnerable nation on Earth to cyber attack ourselves. In international law, when some country targets a nuclear facility, it's an act of war. I understand the difference in destruction is dramatic, but this has the whiff of August 1945. Somebody just used a new weapon, and this weapon will not be put back into the box. Uh, 
going to switch over now. Um, so I'm going to move on to a second project um, that I'm going to share to speak more to this, you know, you know, non-fiction student biometric filmmaking. And uh, this project is called Blackout, and it is a one of the um, in things about you know the United States in the last four years and even in the last election has been the kind of unprecedented nature of uh, the political climate in the UN United States and how polarized it's been and you know a lot of you know has been um, about exploring the lived in experiences of um, people who live in the United States and um, what what their experience of American politics and the polarization has been and so it's an immersive uh, virtual reality documentary that takes place on a New York subway where you, you find um, yourself with this magical ability to be able to read the minds of the strangers around you. And so it examines what it means to live in today's divisive climate, and it explores these real issues through real people that are around us in New York. Um, and so to do this project, we, we, it's essentially our version of a, of a crowdsourced documentary, but for VR. And so we needed a diverse cast that could keep evolving and keep growing. And so how we approached this project is we kept interviewing dozens and dozens of, of New Yorkers um, on a rolling basis. And we definitely in, interviewed people that just did not agree with each other. They didn't meet eye to eye and they just had their own experiences of otherness um, in the United States. Um, and so the goal of this project was to promote a discussion by creating this environment where these complex um, ideas and issues are being uh, shared by these individuals, these personal stories, um, but they, and they don't agree. And so in the space left between, you kind of piece together or connect the dots um, and, and, and weave your own narrative. Um, and so, um, uh, sorry, before I go to the, the I switch over to the, the one thing I'll mention is that um, the types of stories these people shared are, are think, personal experiences with racial discrimination, gentrification, uh, immigration. One of the first refugees from Syria in the United States was in our in our documentary. Um, war, you know, gender politics, sexual orientation, homelessness. It's like all these stories were raw personal stories shared um, by this community. Um, and so I'm going to um, share the trailer. And uh, like before, I'm going to switch over. So give me one moment um, and share. Give you a little snippet of um, what this experience is like. I like to think of the subway as sort of like, like the veins of New York. I hate touching the poles though. The poles are so dirty. Half these people probably didn't even vote. Why is it always white people that I feel like I have to prove myself to? Is that racist to think? American dream, it's really big. How many, many, many thousands of people, they live together like a painting. It's beautiful for me. You know, the good news is you're going to be amazing. And you're going to look great. And you're going to fit in and you're going to find a path. And you will be loved and respected. This is my train. Um, just making sure I've switched over. Thank you for your patience as I DJ. <laughs> um, so um, as you can see in this Blackout trailer, uh, the virtual world and our physical world were mapped one to one. So you can actually hold the physical pole. We built, we built like a subway car for the installation and it would match um, uh, to the virtual world. And so you can actually sit next to these um, holograms of real New Yorkers and really feel like you're, their presence and that, you know, you're, that they're sharing their most intimate thoughts and stories with you. Um, and so this is like our approach to creating a crowdsourced cast um, that would represent the extraordinary breadth of the human experiences in New York City. Um, one thing that's also unique about this project is that no two experiences of blackout are ever the same. So every virtual ride or every audience, your experience is, is unique. And the reason that is, is because every time you enter a, a virtual train or a virtual ride, 
you have a unique set of people that are um, populated on this train. So it's a different grouping every time. It's always random. And um, how you choose to navigate the space, like who you choose to sit next to, who you choose to listen to their stories, um, it would give you a completely different experience. And the way we designed it was that, you know, as a structure, um, you had to kind of earn the, the, the intimacy and the respect almost of, uh, you have to respect the storyteller or the human in front of you. So you only would get shallow stories and thoughts if you just walk by people. But the more you spent time with them, the deeper you would get into um, some of their more um, heartfelt stories. Um, and so, you know, um, that was kind of how we approached this project, you know, and some of the characters we had as an example of the people that we interviewed um, in this process was, you know, Hiba, who you see actually in this um, screen right now. Um, and she's, you know, a young Muslim American woman and she wears the hijab and um, she feels like she doesn't belong in her own country. Um, and then we had Kevin, who was an undocumented student. And, you know, he's been working really hard to create a life for, him, for himself, but He's like facing, um, at least under Trump, this constant threat of his family's deportation and the threat of descending DACA. Um, another example was Lester, who was an African-American U.S. vet, and he was a Trump supporter. He voted for Trump, but he had very complicated feelings about Arabs and Arab Americans and immigrants because he served in Iraq and just kind of, you know, there was just like a lot of confusing kind of um, experiences for him. Um, and then we had John, who is an NYPD black officer, and Dennis, who's a young black man, who described exactly similar run-ins um, from opposite sides of the story. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so forth and so forth. I can keep going on, but I think um, I'll switch now to uh, one of the last projects before talking about um, the tools and the community. So um, this brings me to our latest project. This is um, our newest. It's um, currently uh, doing the festival route. Um, we just premiered it at Sundance in 2021, so like just a few months ago, and then uh, soon uh, this summer at other festivals. And um, what the it's called The Changing Same, and it's a co-production between Scatter and Rada Studio. And The Changing Same is a magical, realist, um, a VR experience where you travel through the time and space to explore 400 years of, of racial injustice in America. So the history of racial injustice in America. Um, and so the goal of this project is remembering and understanding the collective history to allow for a healing and a growth moving forward. So it's a respectful and poetic story infused with magical realism and Afrofuturism. And so as an audience member, you travel through a nonlinear journey and you witness how history has not changed in the United States. It's just evolved into something different. Um, and so we're calling this experience an American pilgrimage through history. Um, so the project confronts the United States history of lynching and it examines how the US's legacy of racial violence is just cyclical and continues in forms such as mass incarceration and police brutality. And so, um, as I mentioned, it's got a lot of our project, uh, projects are documentary or nonfiction. This is actually the first time we moved into a fictional space. So the story is based on real events. So there's real stories that these, um, these episodes are based on, but it's abstracted into what we're calling a speculative fiction. Um, and so the idea with the, the you know, mission with this project is acknowledging the past to build a new future. And so the idea is to retell a lot of these stories you keep hearing, but in, in the context of uh, witnessing and confronting the past um, and then shifting the paradigm of how these stories need to be told and, um, and re, you know, reimagining a, um, a future and, um, and kind of reimagining what that would look like. So imagine what an equitable future would look like for all in the United States. Um, so I'm gonna switch over again to the trailer here. Um, one moment. Stand back and watch for the closing doors. <laughs> Welcome to my world. You know, here in Mariana, you can experience the past and see the future. Our future. <laughs> you want to enter, but entry needs to feel my world. You enter, or you out. And then owning it.
so I'm going to sort of start wrapping up, but I wanted to share a little bit about the process because it is um, a unique process that isn't just about telling stories that are um, you know, important topics, but it's also a way of working um, as a technologist, as a tool builder. Um, and you know, basically, the the kind of core ethos um, um, at you know that I believe in has been kind of a part of my practice actually before even Scatter, but it's also a big part of how we work, work at Scatter. It's the key core, the key kind of driver, which is art is um, propels innovation, and you just can't have one without the other. So our practice of story making is intertwined with tool building. And we're solving for accessibility, inclusivity, and diversity um, to democratize the act of storytelling. And so when we're building um, tools in service of our creative vision or our projects, we're actually new features and the new tools we actually push out to the community, which I'm going to speak a little about too. Um, and so a lot of it is because we're finding the tools out there lacking. This stuff is hard to do. It's not easy to make. Um, and so, um, you know, it allows us to push the limits of our creativity, but, you know, as artists, we, since we need these tools, we, we know the community also needs these tools as well. Um, and that's how we build a depth kit, which is our approach to volumetric filmmaking. And it's what you've seen sort of how all these people have been captured in these pieces. Um, and it's just a software toolkit for accessible volumetric capture using off the shelf hardware. Um, and the way it works is very simple. It captures the world in depth and in color. So it, it's basically a way to capture real people and real human performance. Um, and it's a creative tool that is not just for filmmakers. I want to like be clear about that. It's about creating kind of a new um, uh, range of visual aesthetics and different forms of human expression. And so it's used by the community in, in various different ways. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention about community, which is really important, is like, you know, we're, we're working in a very nascent emerging space and um, we're defining um, the space technically, we're defining this, the language of volumetric filmmaking. But what's very important um, is that because it's such the beginning of this space, it's almost like a, um, a, there's whoever um, the community is that are either using these tools or whoever is creating these stories and whose stories are being told is actually defining the space. And so we invest so much and so heavily in fostering our community. And these are just some of the projects um, uh, made by the community. And you can actually go to our website. And if you want to see other projects besides Scatters, you can see what the world is making and the diversity of the projects out there. Um, you know, and um, there's just a diverse field of creators and people working at things like, you know, virtual um, VFX and music videos to hybrid spaces like Imogen Heap with her VR concert in the wave to experimental music videos and, you know, using it as a VFX tool. Um, and volumetric filmmaking is also used in fiction, feature films and in shorts. And um, it's also being used in documentaries like this HBO documentary that came out in a few years ago. Um, and so um, I guess kind of just to wrap it up, um, you know, I'll just say that uh, I mean, there's many things to talk about and I know we're going to have a Q&A later, but like, I guess um, as, as someone in my position and what's exciting, you know, I come from a tech background, actually, and I'm a, an artist, but I studied computer science and went to art school. And, you know, I was like one of two women, you know, in my program. And then like, uh, you know, always was the only female engineer in my teams until like kind of I moved into the art world. But um, what, why this is exciting to be kind of in this, this seat is like having this new responsibility, like as a co-founder at this tech company, like, you know, we are, inter we can intervene, we can intervene on who is, who this is accessible to, who is using it. And it's not just about America, it's about the rest of the world. This is the, like making sure it's used in the Middle East and in Africa and, you know, in Nepal, wherever people want to make stories and use these tools that are not limited or hindered. Um, and I think that's something that's really important. And so um, it's about not only, and also, you know, on the other side of it is um, using, telling stories that really, you know, we really believe need to be told um, and just building tools that we hope will uh, serve um, um, the community and make sure that they're, they are allowing for this diversity, inclusivity and accessibility. So uh, thank you so much. I will wrap it up here. Thank you, Yasmin, um, for your presentation. And um, uh, if anybody has questions, please post them in the chat. And now we will uh, uh, give the floor to Alessandro Bertelle with his presentation um, if, whenever you're ready. Hello. 
Hi, is the audio working? Hey, hi. Yes, everything is working. So we mute ourselves and uh, disappear and let you speak. Thank okay. you. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, really great to be here and like really great to be uh, presenting with uh, Yasmin. Like <laughs> presentation was great. Um, so I think mine is going to be a bit uh, more uh, on the research side. Um, I'm going to try to see if the one I uploaded is already here. Otherwise, I have to upload it again. Uh, let's see. Yeah, OK. OK, so I will talk a bit, a bit about um, yeah, my past research and uh, I mean, my current research and my some of the experiments uh, I made. Um, I will talking, I will be talking mostly about like uh, world building and especially like, um, like how the use of uh, real time rendering engine is changing the, the landscape of the story that we can tell. Um, But um, I'm probably going to go back and forth between many slides. Um, so feel free to interrupt or like, um, like ask me to like expand or contract some everything that I'm talking about. Um, I will be checking the chat if somebody wants to ask questions. Um, don't, 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 don't feel like you're interrupting the mess. <laughs> Uh, so I, as, as Laura mentioned, I'm like a, a game designer and uh, I come from uh, cinema, uh, study cinema and then moved a bit more into like art and, and then slide into uh, game design uh, when I started using heavily used like re real time rendering engines. So like uh, game, uh, game, like game engine, game design softwares. Um, I'm also the co-founder of the Clino, which uh, is a project that started this year together with uh, Andrea Belosi. Um, and I'm collaborat collaborating with Trust uh, that I will like talk about later in Berlin. Um, so um, the Clino is, um, is a project that, as I said, started this year. So again, I will like kind of like pitch a lot of like the discussion that have been going on around the teams. Um, it's, it's a project aimed at exploring like a distributed autonomous world building and the massive multiplayer entertainment worlds and also like synchronous cinema, um, which is a lot of like uh, fancy buzzwords, but I, I will unpack some of these during this presentation. Um, Let's see. So something that we are really excited about by using uh, real-time rendering engine is how we can move um, from um, how we can move from this kind of like what I describe in this in this um, in this slide as the monolith of the render uh, and moving towards like this real-time golem. Um, so what I what I mean is that. Uh, what we find interesting is like, how can we start thinking of works, uh, video works uh, and formats, which are not finished. They are constantly evolving. They're constantly in the process of being made um, rather than exist uh, in this kind of like monolith timeline in this kind of like um, what, what like Tarkovsky described as like these like pure and separated um, magic circle of um, of like a, like a like a like a film film project. Um, uh, what real time rendering engine is allowed to do is to like always have a channel open for like uh, feedback from the viewers and to allow uh, users to be part of the shaping of um, of our work. Uh, so I think this this touches many areas and um, I, I has like this picture that I really like about the golem is like um, how how like the work it be, start to become like like a like a collective process of making which is like again it's like it's it's constantly um, 
changing, it's con constantly crumbling down, rebuilding itself. Um, and uh, what we are excited about is like, how can this allow us to have this like community led uh, work um, creation? Um, in terms of um, the story that we can tell from within this engine, um, what 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 I what I'm researching is also like how can we move from this like like Campbellian like circular monomyth uh, in which um, again there's this idea of like the standalone the both author and hero and how can we move to this kind of like what I call like the decentralized scatter myth so like how can we build these stories that don't have um, like a center they don't have a balance they are like like an like an accumulation of um, of inputs from different users. Uh, like an, a very good example for this is like in video games, uh, how from from like the single player games uh, we moved into like this massively multiplayer online um, games, which are. Um, which which means that w when when this transition happened, when like the stories co could be made by like this multiplicity of like point of view in a way that the the, the the story was lost because it was impossible to like uh, just uh, fulfill one uh, linear narrative. So uh, what um, what uh, real time rendering engine allows us to do is to start thinking about this like massive storyline where like every one of the viewer is both uh, like a user and a creator of uh, the, the the world itself um, so something that i've been working on is um, like the recent past is also like trying to map some of these um some of like try just to make diagrams of like how story can be like revealed. So like rethink of like the hero's journey, for example, which is this classic um, um, classic um, template, let's say, for like script writing and like storytelling, and like breaking it into like uh, what are the current narratives in like online games or like games in general, I would say. Um, and like in a in a very like playful way, but like how can we like try to build stories from like different diagrams for like um, like um, high speed um, trading diagrams or like from like um, like uh, idle idle games um, uh, and this kind of stuff. Um, I will move to the next slide. So the way we approach world building, um, so like what we do with the Clino, it's it's we, we build worlds uh, basically. So we build like, um, so we moved from like rather to think of the work we want to make and like the story we want to tell. Uh, we started producing uh, like kind of like Lego blocks um more, more as in a game in, in a game design manner of like instead of thinking the final format we think about um the infrastructure and the tool needed to build stories um to allow users to build stories by themselves um so um again rather than than, than producing like a final output we we, pre we produce like like a world and a series of tools um and rules that works within that world um so there is uh something that we try to keep in mind is also to build a world that um that surprises um so we have this to build a world and nurture it and to forget a world and rediscover it um so i think these are like some steps um that we try to keep in mind all the time of um building a world and keeping it alive and allow people to like join in the world and have agency on the world itself. And then for us, um, 
it's also important to like build worlds that why when we jump in we are we don't already know so we don't know anything that's going to happen in there we we kind of can predict some things but we have the same agency as other viewers and this allows us to like rediscover that world and to rethink what we can do with it every time so um i have like some practical example of this i'm going to try to find the right slides probably it's not going to be the right one yes okay um so for example this is like a recent project we made i'm just gonna try to find the first slide of this oops okay should be this okay so uh this is like like um like a music video that we developed together with endgame which is like a uh, like an underground electronic producer um like the project uh, started last year, so it was a very weird moment to start a music video. Uh, first of all, because a lot of music producer just basically lost, uh, like the, their whole profession was cancelled. Um, not being able to tour uh, was like a huge hit. And on, on our side, also like thinking about music videos in this moment, it's, it's very weird because it doesn't seem like there's a platform um, that allows to like monetize fairly um the work um of of this kind of like underground low budget productions and so we kept that in mind and when we we thought like how can we like build a world that apart from being a music video but that can be transformed in many things so it can be transformed in a, in a game and be like a game release uh it can transform in a, a live performance if anything anyway if i mean they will happen at all at some point in the future um but like how can we think of the world we are building has a large and diversified uh, series of output that can allow um um like like a very diverse type of monetization um and and also like how can we build how can we uh, create tools to build this world that we can open to the public later um so that people can create their own version their their own version of this project um, and so for these, um, uh, for this project in particular, I'm showing just like a couple of um, process uh, screenshots uh, of some of the um, tools we created. So we wanted to create it like this kind of empty club or, you know, like this <laughs> club that don't exist anymore. Um, and so we, instead of like just art direct, so this is like some like our approach instead of like art direct and like create and make the plan uh of of the club we created a tool uh that would allows like the game engine to create like a lot of different versions um so we created rules for example how to build walls and these are some slide of like a first um how the engine was like first trying to change and try to build different walls. Um, so it's this kind of like procedural uh, generations. And then, um, and then the engine started to learn and to, to build a bit more complex structures. So like uh, columns were added, um, like a second floor. Um, and again, we were just like looking at the process and, and say like, okay, this is, this is interesting what's coming up. And, and we were thinking like, oh, this would allow us uh, to shoot like this type of video and that type of video. So for us, it was also like a discovery. Uh, and these are like just like some screenshot of how like the, um, the engine was like learning to build walls and like the variation that was creating. And sometimes things were like breaking and I think it created like very interesting patterns, for example. And this is like getting more complex and more complex. And, and it's building a world. And then eventually something like this came out. Um, so like lights were added, like a smoke, uh, some like uh, kind of class under classic underground uh, vibe. And so, you know, and so here we were like, also like playing from inside the world and like discovering interesting corners where we could shoot uh, like a scene so it's 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 like very uh, engaging because we um, we have no idea what's going on. So I mean, we we obviously know uh, what's what's the the rules of the game, but it's keep surprising us. 
And so these are some other screenshots of the world that eventually was created. Um, it's a very grimy look. Um, and the video is it still has to come out, uh, so I, I, I can't unfortunately share it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is like one way of approaching work, uh, like like artworks from within these like procedural uh, environments. Um, I'm gonna go back and talk more about um, yeah I mean we also maybe I'm gonna skip this slide but we also wanted to talk obviously like about um, like the problematic also the problematics of like working with interaction interactive media and like the like there's a lot of like case studies of like interactive media that have been used to like control and like oppress viewers, which obviously that's not what we want to do, but there's like, um, you know, like one of the most famous example is in the seventies in the, in Czechoslovakia, like there was um, like a TV show um, that uh, became interactive in a way that the people could, um, could decide where the show was going by, uh, it was kind of like a complex uh, interface to be in the 70s. So basically people would watch the show and at some point the show, show would, would stop and they had two options to decide. Um, and uh, by turning on and off the lights in the room, uh, the, um, the, the electricity company would like understand uh, what the selection was and then the majority would like make the show go forward. Um, and this obviously like in, in like an oppressive regime turned out to be a way to understand like political choices of people. Uh, and, 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 and this type of like interactive media, this type of like way of understanding, um, of understanding interaction, user interaction uh, is still very present. Uh, like Netflix recently or like a couple of years ago, uh, re released this uh, Black Mirror episodes where you could also like choose things. And of course it turns out then to just be like a data mining um, process in which you want to turn, you want to hide, you want to like give the illusion to the viewer that they have agency over the work, um, but it actually just turning them into like workforce. You, you're turning their passive like way of like, uh, like consuming your media into like an active type of like labor extraction um, and we like obviously are not absolutely interested in that uh, we are interested in giving like actual agency over well like we think that like real-time rendering ages have the potential to give like a real-time rendering engine have the potential to give true agency and like a true uh, governance power to the viewers so that the viewers can like reshape the content of the work in real time um, um, during during the the um, during the, the the consumption of the product itself so you can think of a series of uh, practical example like like the lowest hanging fruit would be like if i'm telling a story using a game engine and the people feels like they don't uh they don't connect on or that the main character of the story is not represented uh by them by by the character that they use that they could change it uh you know and in this way that they could produce like very counterintuitive or or even like very intuitive things that unfortunately uh, don't get uh, issued um, um so so we are interested in that kind of agency we are the, we are interested in that uh type of building like a democratic governance over our work uh so that the figure of the author gets like decentralized and get like distributed between all the people that is participating in the viewing of the projects. Uh, so like these two um, pictures that I made was were, were just like, it's like on the left is like Eisenstein uh, talking about uh, world, the, the, the Disney world building. And there's this idea of like how um, freedom uh, is somehow connected to this, um, to like this way of like controlling the world. 
And as I showed in the previous uh, slides, what you are actually trying to do is like a world that can, the, a world that can, like in the future, we also want the world to be able to govern itself and change itself. Um, but for now, it's uh, it's just a way of the world to like surprise and escape uh, like the type of control that inevitably we um, uh, exert by uh, creating the rules, the basic rules of how it functions. And on the right, it's some. Uh, it's an excerpt from um, like this uh, modular governance. So these are interesting points that we try to implement while in, in, in every world we build. Um, so I will probably, I'm talking too much, so I will move um, quickly. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about another very uh, interesting project that we are developing together with Trust in Berlin. Uh, I will um, quickly read, if I find it, what trust is. Um, I don't want to mistake it, so I'm reading from their website. Uh, trust is a collective project for the research, development, and maintenance of shared infrastructure in imaginaries. And it's uh, based in Berlin. So with them, we are uh, developing, a, we develop a series of uh, what we call mascot streams which are uh, a series, uh, you can also read it below, is a series of experiments in building real-time stream environments in a real engine. Uh, each stream explores parallels between economic and game mechanisms, uh, using those same game mechanics to trigger readings from relevant texts. Each stream additionally tackles a different experiment, allowing for collective involvement in play and world building through Twitch, from live gambling via chat to in-stream viewer representation. And so what this means is that we are, this is like the first stream we made. Um, it has like uh, ARB, which is this like red uh, axolot character that you can see. And uh, the character it's a live um, puppeteer by, um, by like, a, like a person, uh, by like the streamer um, and um, so, so that means like there is like his face is tracked uh, on a real face of an actor. And the world has a series of, um, the world has a series of inputs that people can through Twitch, through the chat of Twitch can trigger to change the world. Um, so I'm gonna uh, do the same thing that Yasmin did and uh, VJ and show you a little video from it to explain it is better. Um, and I will probably continue to talk over it. So this is like the world of ARB and this little island. I'm going to try to skip the, the streams are normally like between around two hours. So I'm going to try to skip to like a proper an interesting bit to show you a bit of the mechanic. Uh, so this is our main character and this is the world he lives in. And we have like uh, control of every aspects of the world. So we can change uh, the camera. Obviously we can change uh, the world itself, the weather and this kind of stuff. Um, and the format, uh, as I read, the format follows, this, this specific format follows, uh, we always play a game and we try to discuss um, the game mechanic itself. We try to find uh, like a text um, and we read the text so, during during the stream um, as well. Um, playing, so this was, uh, for example, like a stream in which we played Factorio, which is like a, uh, like management can... construction so, uh, game type design. of game. So, uh, more or less, Factorio, and in the uh, meantime, and, and in, in the game, you have to like check uh, build like software. factories via an until like you destroy Earth and you like you can leave the planet. So you have to build parts of the view spaceship and leave the planets more or less. Um, and we were reading like Jeff Bezos master plan um, connected to the fact that he was starting also like a, like a, like a space exploration company. However, as an um, Players and past um, the end of the so this was the first text, uh, one of the first streams. And then uh, I want to show you another type of stream we made, 
uh, that became a bit more the, complex uh, in the type of uh, interaction that people uh, can have. Contaminated by you um, expanding the logistical infrastructure uh, to basically... Let's see, I might share another video. So this was the last stream we made. Um, we and fucked up because we were playing uh, like so these kind of like gacha mechanic games. Um, and we were talking about gambling and addiction. Um, and we decided we have, to like have uh, this kind of like spinning wheel that people could trigger through the chat no and um, okay. and they could win prizes. Thank so you. again, we were like gamifying we the, the, the discussion uh, that we were having so while we were also playing games that were using the same mechanics. Uh, All of these five. ways can be found. And uh, as you can the, see, like people could the, embody the like butterflies the in the world, window, so they could participate and be participants in the game. With a star on it. And uh, this is just like a. This, this, this whole and set of streams were of, all like a, uh, like a way activities. for us to test what you need to do uh, to is, like even like stress test with me. You need the functionality and what roll could be to done spin within this world to win. and uh, this uh, no, character like and chat. Uh, was <laughs> as you can see has like so also a mask and this was like played Earth, by two you people together the magic dice. Uh, was me and Arthur if you do not uh, playing have together so we are experimenting also in like how can people how can different people or even like institution and organization um, um, and body like an avatar just and how the would that avatar that, look like get and how would they behave eggs. and how would, eggs are, would therefore the story change down a little bit in behavior. price yeah. but um, we're still quite stable and okay, I'm yeah, going to show you know one if, last if was, stream really that's uh, a bit uh, different it's not part of the main series we are but it's yes I said that okay we also use some mechanics. Um, so this is a, a stream organized by Monilab, and it was like uh, like a discussion about uh, socializing tokens with Laura Lotti, Medre Hars, Sarah Friend, and Wasima Cindy. And in this one, we decided that when this while the speakers would discuss the topics, we gave the part like everybody participant in the chat the. Um, uh, the ability to like spawn tokens. So they would just like uh, type uh, like a command in the chat, in the Twitch chat, and they would be able to spawn one of these tokens that you see on the board. Um, and it's very interesting because we create these basic rules without explaining what they would do. Uh, and and the people, the participate, people participating in the in the stream uh, kind of like started finding ways of using them so um they would uh, for example they every they could spawn one token for each uh of the view of the mm -hmm. they could specify for which for who of the four speakers the token was for and uh but that was all there was to it and in the chat like there was a lot of people that who were like spawn tokens just because they wanted everybody to have the same amount or who would spawn tokens because they would really enjoying what the speaker was saying and all these kind of like dynamics that emerged uh, spontaneously in the chat and um so yeah this is a very interesting uh, experiments uh, to see how people just create their own storylines um once you give them um like a more a more flexible tool um so let me go back to the presentation and so yeah these are some screens like the like we have like a very positive um a very positive response for the viewers and what was really amazing is to see like all the how much the the, the people like connected to the characters and like all the like fan made uh, work that they produced um that's something that that we really I, I really love when when people just feel comfortable in like appropriating the work and creating their own version of it. Um, yeah, so I think like I talked enough and uh, uh, these are two links, the Casa. it's like our website if you want to get in touch with us. And if you want to watch some of these streams, they're really amazing, you can go to uh, the second link, link and uh, you can also enjoy, join like the Discord of Trust, which is a very thriving community and find out more about us there as well. So thank you.
Thank you, Alessandro. This was super interesting and also it adds to um, like Yasmin's presentation and to show how many possibilities there are with the with storytelling and with the tools and how the tools inform inform the story. And I think, um, I mean, I, we have a few questions that we are collecting in the chat, but um, I think both uh, your approaches kind of come from some sort of um, perhaps like a frustration with the limitations of like traditional media and like telling a story that has a, a protagonist, a beginning and an end. And uh, also somehow maybe, uh, not, uh, not, not, maybe not a frustration, but like a desire to go beyond also um, a single position and a single POV, a single point of view, and also a single point of view in terms of uh, um, the, the position, for example, as a, as a journalist or as a, as a protagonist, as direct protagonist or, um, or as, a, as, a art, as an artist. So the intersection also between um, entertainment and, uh, and, in, and, the, and the information and uh, how these different aesthetics uh, in, interact and uh, layer on top of each other and how also they problematize the, the content itself. So um, uh, I think it's very interesting to see uh, that also one story can also be narrated through different perspectives and, and through different media. So uh, I will also read the questions, but if you have something to say also about, uh, about this or about each other's work, that's, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I will. I will. I, I have something to say, but I, I will let you go to the to the questions. I think they were like I wanted to read them like during I was speaking, but they were long and was like stressed. <laughs> so. Yeah. So there is a question for Yasmin. Um, so. She was also not very, uh, uh, like the question was about um, a technical question, like how did you scan the metro and the 3D modeling? Uh, and um, what was the motivation for using a less finished scan of the, of the protagonist to let, leave it a little bit un undefined? And also um, she was curious about if the experience was interactive in the sense of like where people talking to themselves and could, could hear others or they had to come close or interact directly with the person. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. So that's specifically, I'm assuming around Blackout, the, the second project I shared. Um, so I'll answer in the order I remember the questions in. Uh, so first is um, uh, the technical, like kind of how we made it. Um, so one thing that um, I'll just share in general, so this is actually true of all the projects, it's not just Blackout, but the subway and also in the changing same, it's the same technique. Um, for us, like the umbrella of volumetric filmmaking is um, how do you capture the real world? And I like to call it translating the real world. So we use a variety of what you can consider reality capture techniques. Um, and so for both the subway, for the subway specifically, since that's your question, this is a, a technique called photogrammetry. Um, and then using the photogrammetry with 3D modeling um, or some techniques from 3D modeling and texture painting and other things. But basically it's, it's actually a real subway that's been captured using thousands of photos. Um, and that's the same technique for a lot of our worlds. Um, obviously not zero days, because that's a, a digital world that's made up. But for um, the changing same that we actually went to a location in Florida, it's a swamp um, and we all the trees and all the environments were using photogrammetry as well. Um, and then we stylize them differently for different projects. So that's that question. Um, 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 I'll speak quickly to the interactivity, then come back to the last, uh, or the, whatever was the first question. So the interactivity for, for Blackout is, I like to call it like um, human uh, interactive design. Like it's based on human social mechanics. Um, and so the idea was, uh, kind of imitating how people normally are in the subway. You kind of mind your own business, you kind of move around, you sit, you do, you know, you do these normal basic mechanics, but um, you have this magic ability, as I mentioned, um, where you can read the thoughts of strangers. And so we designed what we call these intimacy 
metrics. Um, so you had to actually be looking at the person to hear their thoughts. The closer you get, as I said, you kind of are starting to build this intimacy metric. And if you spent more time with them, this and if the intimacy metric was established and it was high enough, you'd actually access like we'd start interact like we'd generate these more deeper stories. Um, also, uh, there's different depending on how you navigate this space, different types of topics and themes would emerge. And there's also a narrative arc that's um, uh, would would be built based on how you move through the space and who you spend time with. So um, it, it might not be super obvious. It's a very more subtle gaze based and presence based and intimacy based approach, but it felt quite natural and human. So it's it's a, it might seem invisible, but you are controlling it. And then finally, the last question around the tool and the, the for Blackout specifically, well, actually not just Blackout, every project you'll notice a different approach to the volumetric filmmaking and the use of depth kit and the scanning of humans. So for like zero days, our NSA informant is very digital and and glitchy on purpose um, to match the, the theme of the you know um, of the project, and then changing same they're more photo real um, because of the heaviness of the subject matter. Just you know we didn't want to distract there. And then for blackout, um, it's actually just the nature of um, where we were with the tools and what hardware was accessible. So we're five years old as a startup, and blackout was 2017, and it was our first multicam, multi-camera three full 360 capture. Um, approach and it was with older technology, older depth sensors. Uh, you know, now four years later, we have better depth sensors, higher quality, better machines, and so literally what you saw in Changing Same is just the better technology, and also our technology has gotten better because of it. And so it's just the natural evolution of technology and maturation. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. That's great. I also have a quick question about. Like, did you have a chance to speak to the audience and like get feedback from and like what what they found uh, what they what they found different from this experience in uh, from from previous works that they had and like yeah I'm just curious about like direct feedback from uh, from audiences because I think that's also really informs the way the way you work so yeah I'm just curious what you got yeah um is for specifically blackout or just in general in the different projects uh, both for both for blackout and for zero days uh yeah i'm i'm, I'm just curious to hear what uh, what audiences would uh, would how how would they would react uh, as a surprise or uh, just like yeah i'm just curious yeah, they're, they're very different projects, obviously, and um, very different reactions. Um, I will say with Blackout, um, it's, it's it was a very human experience from the sense that, like, you know, these are real, very, some of them are very vulnerable stories. And I think people went in there having very human responses, depending on who you could relate to. So some people got, like, would cry, some people would laugh, some people, like, just could not do anything except spend one time with one person they were fascinated with. So it was just, like, um, um, you know, it's just like uh, that kind of experience and just having access to a stranger and getting their heartfelt, you know, stories. But then also the people that we captured, we invited them back to see themselves as holograms. And that was a very special experience because a lot of them were very brave. Like, as I mentioned, the undocumented student, we also had a man who came out about being HIV positive. We had a lot of people come out and use this platform to share something with the community that they normally would not share. Um, and so they be, they were very vulnerable at a time that was, you know, you, should, you shouldn't have to be. And so they actually, and their community that they're in friends and family, they had a really emotional response um, seeing themselves. So that, that was just a very different project. Um, and quickly, just about zero days, um, that project is unique because it's uh, it's kind of a tricky one where the United States doesn't admit a lot of what's in this documentary. Um, it, you know, the New York Times covered it and um, it, the international cyber detective community and cyber experts all say the United States and Israel built this 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 stuck site. So like there's something um, about like, uh, you know, we released it on the game in a gaming store in Oculus. If anyone has Steam or Oculus and the comments we get is like, this is propaganda by Iran and things like that. Like, so we're having a little, little hate mail. <laughs> um, but otherwise, um, I think what was interesting is like, it's, um, um, it won an award for like an original approach to a documentary. Like one thing that's interesting is like, it's completely made up world. It's not actually really going to Natanz. We, we kind of figured out what Natanz would look like. We figured out from models what a centrifuge should look like. So it is a little bit of creative fiction that we filled in blanks and, and took liberty. Um, but it was still considered by the news and documentary, like, uh, you know, award body that this was still documentary. It's still journalism. It still maintains integrity. 
Um, and we worked obviously with Alex Gibney, he was the executive producer for it. So um, to maintain, make sure that we were true, staying true to the story. So I think that there, it was just about a different approach. It was a different audience here. We're trying to, you know, this is like a journalism, this is documentary, it's a cyber intrusion, it's a difficult subject. Um, and one that's also politically not completely admitted to by the United States. So just very different. <laughs> Yeah, I think there is uh, in in both your 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 work uh, in, in, there is something really powerful in like not being fed all the information and all the story and leaving some sort some form of agency to the to the audience and who, who, to whoever is participating in uh, in 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 this. So yeah, also Alessandro, if you have uh, some comments or like from about what we said earlier and. Uh, you're welcome. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this this uh, leaving like uh, some 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 leeway to the to whoever is like present and like uh, viewing your work. I mean, it's it's really interesting, but also like um, yeah, to just like leave uh, a certain. Um, like a certain aspects of unfinished like yeah to, to to kind of leave some unfinished um uh paths that can be um that can can be like completed by whoever is uh, viewing so like give some responsibility to the viewer to also like um complete uh the story that you tell um so that 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 is stratifies like with 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 your with your vision and that then like it doesn't become this like, um, yeah, this just like unique uh, or pure uh, um, way of like storytelling. Yeah. Um, so we have another question. So. Um... Do you have op opinions, both of you, about uh, the actual agency and impact uh, of this kind of, um, of formats in actual political discourses like now and in the future? And also because also, Yasmin, you explicitly mentioned uh, that this um, could be the future of, of documentary filmmaking and uh, in general, like different formats and different languages can they actually influence the political discourse and uh, have an impact on uh, on uh, positive change and uh, more progressive critical narratives? Just uh, yeah, your your general opinion, both of you, uh, around this. Um, sure, I'll go first. I mean, um, uh, I have a mixed sort of uh, response about this. You know, obviously, there, you have to be a little humble about the how far something in a headset that's not accessible in the world, you know, can go. So a lot of this work is in these needs a pretty heavy gaming PC and like a headset. And I don't know what the install base is anymore, but um, at the time, you know, they are they were quite limited worldwide and also geo blocking and all of that. So just like in the context of distribution, it's still not, you know, uh, uh, widely distributed. Um, but uh, with that being said, I do see things, doors that did open or audiences that, um, being reached that uh, at least I have never had an experience of reaching before. So like Zero Days, for example, we went on very basic gaming stores. And so and, and we also went on um, third party apps. So we're on mobile phones and the web. And so we did reach. Um, um, audiences that probably wouldn't pick up this feature talking head documentary because it's two hours about you know you know a, a, a cyber stuck that virus and who knows like the maybe it's a different type of documentary audience that would watch that versus um, we did access a different type of community it is a, mostly a gaming community since they go to these stores but um, so there's new audiences that got to watch it um, and experience it and then we're, we also got invited by the World Economic Forum because they have a they had a whole new um, uh, cybersecurity initiative in 2018, um, and so we were invited to showcase. And so a lot of world leaders, even people who work in cybersecurity, uh, and funny enough, um, uh, some uh, I won't name which country people who actually 
worked on this project <laughs> uh, came and saw it and, and um, react, you know, so there was conversations being had, even if it's a limited, you know, VIP world, they were at least like discussing it. Um, um, even some American politicians passed by and talked to us about it. So some discussion was being had at that level and, you know, right next to their cybersecurity kind of space that they were holding. Um, but, but I think the real thing, at least for changing same, which is like very relevant right now, especially if, if anyone's following American news, there's like the, you know, the Derek Chauvin trial and like, there's like, um, the movement is still going strong since last year. Um, and we are doing a, a much more grassroots community level outreach and education and just approaching it very differently with a curriculum and going out into the United States, going to schools and going in a kind of more educational community outreach arm and, um, obviously, that's more work and investment, but it's a different model, and I think that for that project, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I I can add. I mean, like obviously, uh, for us, working a lot with yeah, also with like the gaming community or like video games in general, and uh, that that is like a heavily politicized. Um, environment in in a way that uh like the narratives that are being like uh developed from like like the narratives that are being developed uh also influence the tools that that are built in order to like achieve that type of stories and so for us like kind of like important to like think of like uh yeah like how can we develop tools that will because of the way they are made they will bring to like having to rethink how you build that narrative. So for us, for example, the example of having like creating environment, not by um, handcrafting them ourselves, but to leave like something, some like a leeway for the error, for like computational error uh, in the work is a way for them to have uh, like think of like having to deal with the, with the problems of the world rather than crafting this like perfectly controlled environment. Um, and also like, uh, yeah, we trust, we trust, we talk a lot about uh, governance and like, how can we like let, uh, like people that, uh, enjoy our formats, create some value out of it. Uh, you know, being, having like a kind of like economical system within the community that you can like, um, like you can get rewards or like you can get, uh, some kind of like, um, yeah, value out of like the simple participating in this in the community. Um, so yeah, and I mean for all, us, it's also very important to like uh, as the cleaner to like uh, every time we work on something to think of like ways that we can develop uh, tools and then always release those tools to the public. Uh, so like so that people can just use them to create completely different things or even just to have a kickstart. Uh, so like democrat democratizing the tools uh, that we develop. Um, yeah. We have another quick question for, for you. Um, what is going to be the future form for for the Declino project beside the end game music video? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, we um, yeah, we are still, as I said, we are like we the 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 the, the project or company or whatever we want to call it started like a couple of months ago, uh, so we are still trying to like. Um, um, yeah, place ourselves in, a, in 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 the, like in this the industry, um, but I think like that um, the form that is gonna make that is gonna take is probably like to um, be like a like like both a world building and like a tool building company, so that we want to um, well, I mean, also I'm I'm you know as I said I'm a, like co-founder so. Well, that's, that's, that's my point of view and what we discussed, but I just want to say there's probably also like a half opinion missing. Um, but um, yeah, so we, what we would like to do is like start to build these like modular tools uh, that people can use to build their own worlds. Um, so we want to develop, um, yeah, just just like a, like kind of like a, like a library, library of assets and um, 
and like governance tool and like economic models that people can then like take and like build up and create their own version of, of this type of worlds. Um, and in that way also like create like type kind of try to think of like different way of like um, reward the community of like creators that we, we are going to involve because like I think like especially now like or you know like for example with music videos like the music video industry it's absolutely not sustainable like there's no money uh, there's no way of monetize your work like half the time that I work on music videos uh, like I get like threatened by YouTube because they think I don't have the rights to use the song and this kind of stuff so it's so it's like we 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 are also like like thinking of new ways of like new platforms to like release this kind of works and um but especially we are interested in creating like 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 a bit of like an innovative way of like reward the creator of the work so for example like if we create a world and we have like a chair we don't produce the chair ourselves but we are just allow the community to develop their own version and then get paid uh, by publishing that chair in like X world and like the fact that these worlds are like real time allows you to like change uh, like a high variety of assets so like once the world is built it doesn't matter like you can still change anything in it and uh, so yeah I mean we are discussing and talking about a lot of this kind of stuff. Thank you yes I was also this is also a question for for both of you but like we, we're often thinking about different forms of literacy and how to apply all of these uh, uh, new technologies in um, in education and for young people and how teaching these kind of tools can be fun and critical also for for young people so that they can uh, have more um, agency also over over the tools not only uh, consuming uh, content but also having this um, this uh, agency in uh, in uh, in knowing how to use them. So yeah, if you think. Should I should I go first? Um, um, yeah, literacy is a good question. Like, um, well, first of all, something that like I'm very interesting in the in the like in, in using these like game worlds is also like to create a, or like to like yeah like create a kind of like literacy for like the gaming world like i think it's the the you know we did this mistake already with social networking just just let it get out of control and uh and in the gaming industry being like like the the, the main industry which is booming and you know and it's like just like the classic uh quote of like the gaming industry being like uh, worth more than than like the cinema, the like um, music and like uh, editorial um, book industry together. Uh, it's 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 obviously that there's there's like it, being in, in this great expansion. There's like it's a very unknown territory, and it seems like that like you know when governments start to step in also like to uh, create regulations for how like these game worlds should be developed their main concern is always this kind of like addiction like games should not be played too much but there's very few times like a discourse of like how can we make these games uh like sustainable and like how can we like create value that it's not always returning back into the hand of the game developers like big game developers i mean like not like the indie um uh, so like how can we for example reward people that are playing games for like 10 12 hours a day, a day? Um, because the, the the main model right now is probably like either being like a professional gamer or like being a streamer and we're already like seeing like streamers that are like obviously making tons of money but they're also like like streaming like 100 200 hours uh like yeah 200 100 hours a week 200 hours maybe like bi-weekly which is like which is like a lot it's like 10 12 hours a day of working um so like i think like creating like literacy about like these new uh markets and this like this new economy and this new like, like ecosystem it's really important to avoid like like a huge exploitation uh taking place and also in my experience with trust for example uh being like the stream uh being like a very um 
high level, I would say, uh, academic and uh, uh, um, literate environment. I, I really love like how game like opens up uh, for me. Like I think they they open up a lot uh, to like a wider audience that doesn't necessarily have like. Uh, the, liter the li literacy to like understand all of the topics yet, uh, but through the games, they, they can be like a first approach to practically understand uh, the consequences of topics that are being told. For example, in our stream with the tokens, it was clear that it was a practical example of all that was discussed uh, in, in, the, in the talk, but it was like a very approachable um, way of enter entering that world. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, Yasmin, also if you have some, something to say about in, in, in relation to this topic, because it's, it's really one of the, the main points also of your practice to build the, the tools collaboratively. And if you're thinking also about younger generation or you, if you already had an experience with that. Yeah, I mean, um, it's kind of a work in progress is the most honest answer. But um, I mean, I guess it depends on which part of the ecosystem we're talking about. I think it's important to mention that there is different layers um, that we do think about it. And I'll, I'll, I can speak to that, which is um, obviously I have a little bit of a, a bias because I am based in the United States. I grew up in Silicon Valley. Um, I also lived in Egypt. And so like I have like these life experiences of like, what inequity looks like, what, you know, lack of access looks like being based in Africa or in the Middle East. Also, like what Silicon Valley and the complete, you know, like disparity is and also the homogeny of, um, you know, being an engineer or being in, in that kind of tech world um, and who builds the tools. So there, I guess like starting from like, and this is why this is really important to me. Um, I think who builds the tools really influences everything after. Like, I do think it starts there. Um, I don't think just about, it's not just about um, accessibility on the consumer end. I actually think who designs technology and why they're designing technology and for who they're designing technology is a big part of this. Um, and it's the beginning of the of the ecosystem. Um, just a simple example is like, um, since I work in the immersive uh, XR space, like these headsets are not made for natural hair. Like for example, they like rip in the Velcro and like just a very basic thing, you know, like um, obviously no one with natural hair <laughs> built these, um, but it's it's a, something basic, but it's true. And that's kind of how I feel about lots of technology. So I'll just say like the, bi the technical bias and coding bias in it from the beginning. And then um, on the other side of it, um, I mean, at least how we think about it, like we obviously have a very strong POV of what we, we're trying to solve for, which is, you know, volumetric capture, human presence, human performance. Um, and right now, like kind of the options are stages that are like, you know, several thousands of dollars or, um, or hardware that is like um, more expensive. And we're trying to literally build um, software that like can run off a laptop and um, a, a, a Connect, which you can buy, like a, a, a Microsoft Connect. So that's like how we do it. It's like, and so the choices are off the shelf hardware in order to make sure that these issues of um, inequity or access, at least globally, and also um, just you know access to the, the actual like process, like the, even the first step, which is the hardware. Um, and then I'll say that on the other ecosystem, it's like the, the who is publishing, whose work is getting out, and this stuff is hard. So like even though we are trying to democratize the tools of creation, there is still a um, barrier to entry, in my opinion, um, uh, to the stuff is expensive, it's hard to make, it's like sometimes, I mean, you don't have to know how to code, but you know, it is, a, it still is a pretty, requires some tech savviness, or at least a team or collaborators. Um, and so I would say like, um, and even just like publishing is not simple, especially for these game, like these different platforms, because you have to work on different machines, there's different min specs, it's like not simple to get something distributed. And, um, and so I would say that like, uh, um, whose work then is actually getting out to the rest of the ecosystem is the other part of the problem. Um, and, you know, I can't solve that. We're not working on solving that, but I think that's actually the last piece of the puzzle that can, that like, you know, even though we don't work in that kind of publishing side, I really, I really like, this is the kind of thing that I, I think is kind of missing right now. I'm not sure who is, and I, I'd love to hear if anyone in this audience knows, but I think that's kind of the last piece. And, um, and also just the gatekeepers finally, which is, um, a lot of these platforms, for example, depending on certain subject matter they don't think is um, should go um, on their platform or whatever they, they they actually some of them do 
block certain content or they don't accept it. So it's not even open, if, even if you can get to the milestone of, of publishing. Um, so I think there's still problems in this space. Obviously, if you go through Twitch or these other platforms, that's a, it's a great workaround, but um, it's still a problem, I would say, in this gaming um, and platform space. Yeah, thank you. Um, this is also like opens up a lot of different issues related to access and to, yes, availability of some tools, but also there are uh, some contexts in which these tools are not um, accessible or it depends or uh, on, uh, on uh, the costs or on the level of connectivity that you have in a certain geographic context and also um, yeah, like in terms of the content itself and how potentially um, dangerous it can be to 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 distribute it. So Adef, as as you know, uh, like organizes um, camps for uh, um, um, like for teenagers and young people to like learn all these creative tools and also uh, build their own. And uh, so yeah, we were wondering also for for both of you, how would you Imagine this kind of tools being uh, being built, um, uh, and um, in, in the context of these kind of uh, these uh, in, intensive camps, and uh, um, where there is like a, a space for experimentation and for developing criticality and for developing, um, yeah, critical agency over the tools and over the stories to tell. So we're wondering with. Um, how would how would you imagine these tools being built in this context, and how would you negotiate these issues related to access and uh, uh, and um, access censorship, uh, availability of these tools, and uh, kind of trying to bypass all the uh, obstacles somehow? Both of you, also, if you want. to. Uh, I will try to answer this it's uh it's yeah it's i mean like it's it's obvious i mean it's it's hard as like like when you when you produce this this kind of like tools to um yeah like being universal obviously like there, there's always like limitations of and um like a like like the way we're like the reason why i'm interested also like in in developing this like um like our format from scratch is for example because we we found a lot of like these tools uh these like third party like uh like automated plugin that that we are using uh that yeah like they they are always very specific to like uh, like for example like the like some plugins that we use to like uh track like the face of uh the, the the speaker to the to the character that we use are always very very like um human like you can only do human avatars uh and 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 the problem is that those uh those uh tools are the one that are more accessible for everyone so inevitably people will produce things that more and more look like uh like standardized and uh, so I think it's like it, it's always, I guess, important like um, to kind of like for me to like kind of um, to kind of like uh, let people understand that whatever they are building, it's it, it can break, it can be done wrong. Uh, you know, like the tools, uh, the tools should be used wrong, and uh, like I don't know, like 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 a ra rather rather have um, yeah, like try to like like get whatever is accessible and trying to like reuse it in the most uh, like uh, un uncommon ways. Um, yeah, I don't know, like, like always keep the bash, like the, 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 the kind of like uh, tools that are available to like merge them into this like kind of like Frankenstein uh, thing. Uh. Yeah, exactly. Like the main one of the main points is that like there isn't one way, one default way to do things. And it's very important that also from like 
very young age, anybody who's interested in, in these tools needs to like find themselves like as a first approach, knowing that everything is designed and everything can be redesigned or broken or used, uh, misused or hacked somehow. And this is what also Adef has been trying to do also with this, uh, with these residencies and these programs where people basically have the, the space to experiment and play and the, the playfulness as, a, as the main attitude to, to the tools themselves. Also, Yasmin, you, if you have something to say about this, and then I have uh, one last question. Yeah, I mean, I have a few thoughts, and um, I'm not speaking now as Scatter, I'm just speaking as myself or um, an expert in the field. It's just like my life experience, which is um, uh, what I appreciate about kind of um, uh, these workshops you're describing and just giving, um, I, I'm not sure what age group we're talking about, but like it, I'm assuming younger, <laughs> uh, younger age groups, just giving them access to, first of all, tools, building blocks. And even if like they are burdened by sort of what, you know, um, you know, what we've been talking about, which is kind of these already like uh, whatever it is, it's like these already standardized or, you know, homogenous tools or avatars or whatever. The issue here is, or not the issue, the opportunity, I actually think is like, I kind of feel like, well, it doesn't matter, hopefully, because as long as they start having building blocks and tools, I actually think that um, they're now equipped and um, it's like out of the not, not seeing like yourself being represented, number one, or not seeing... Um, or not having like, or having a lot of constraints in being able to create your work is where innovation and new tools and new approaches are born. Um, and, um, you know, I can speak from my experience living in the Middle East. It's like a lot of startups happen because these are a lot of experiences you won't have and have in like, at least the United States, but specifically Cairo suffers from certain things. And so because of these certain constraints, a lot of new and innovative technology pops up. And this is something that's like, universal, you know? And so um, I think that's what's exciting to me is the opportunity of what this future, you know, generation would build once they just have the, the building blocks. And an example I'll mention is like a friend of mine here in New York, she's um, um, a black um, um, artist and she had a huge issue with um, Fortnite because um, a lot of the issues with Fortnite, if those who know this like kind of game and, and engine, it's like they appropriate a lot of black culture and dance moves and rename them. Um, they also like the, the problems with that kind of what the avatars look like, a lot of the things we're talking about. And so she's building something called the Black Movement Library and instead just like capturing Black performance, Black movement and building her own library, open source, and other people can use it. And I think that's the example of what um, artists can do, what technologists can do. If they just have the building blocks and they don't like what they're seeing, they can actually impact it. And so that's the opportunity I hope for and see. Yeah, that's uh, that's great. I was also thinking, um, like, um, also in in relation to what Alessandro was talking about, the process of making the the world for the music video and to interact uh, and, and to kind of like uh, um, ex like take advantage of this uh, these restrictions because of the limited movement uh, that we are all experiencing because of uh, experiencing because of the of the pandemic and how you know obstacles sometimes uh, open up um, uh, motivation also for for being more creative also in how to in how like we we use the tools and it, it's also related to to the themes of the um, of the questions uh, raised uh, in in the in the festival about um, like media production and journalism and the fact that uh, the limits uh, to the freedom of movement uh, uh, are kind of like also um, encouraging uh, the production of content only in the virtual world somehow because it's also much more expensive and much riskier uh, to actually go and report from the ground and uh, you know interact with people and uh, and also hire many more people and many more professional figures when when telling a story so there are you know opportunities but also um, dangers somehow uh, in the evolution of this uh, of this technology and how it's encouraging the the production side in uh, investing only on uh, on this aspect um, 
and uh, the, we have a question also about the um, like how uh, the question is how immersive are these worlds and uh, and how immersive are these experiences and what are the main and most important elements uh, you in your opinion to make these uh, uh, to make it appear immersive and to create uh, and to create interactivity these two aspects which are not necessarily um, like they could be also very different as like the immersiveness can be the opposite of interactivity and and there and there can be interactivity also in immersiveness so yeah also i'm, I'm curious about the your opinion on these topics i'll jump in first um so uh, let's see, how immersive are these worlds? Um, I will say, first of all, it's not one size fits all. Like, I don't think there's anything that uh, is a, a blanket definition of an interactivity or immersiveness in general in this space is uh, how I'll start. And I'll even just speak about the projects I shared just so we have like a context. Um, they're all very different. Um, and I would say, um, I mean, I'm, my perspective, like I go in as an artist and as an immersive director, um, every project is very different and it all starts with my goals for what I'm trying to tell, the story, the story first, and then the audience um, experience I want to build and my goals there. Um, and so I would say then the definition of what immersive is and the tools you use should be different depending on those two things. Um, so. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't know how to define how immersive I, you know, I personally think these are very immersive experiences from the perspective where you are in a completely different world. You feel like you're there. You, um, we play with tools like um, fear of your fear of natural human fears, like um, uh, scary camera movements, free falling, uh, changing physics, changing like, sorry, I need a drink of water. <laughs> um, yeah, so like different types of. Um, uh, experiential tools that are not just narrative and not just like interactivity with a joystick or like things like that. So it's like playing with um, a lot of different things that really play with your mind. And for me, that's what's immersive. Like it's like you having either agency as, a, as an audience member to look wherever you want to set, like, you know, move around the world as you want. But also like if you actually feel like the presence of the world you're in, whether or not there's a human or not, like um, for me, that's what immersive is, is like feeling you're in, you're in the story world itself and having that agency. And then regarding um, what is the most, I mean, I think the most important things for me is like leveraging the different types of experiential tools. That's all I can say, like depending on what serves your story and what serves your, your goals with the audience. Um, uh, and so that could be many different things. Um, and like, for example, for Blackout, the interactivity I mentioned already, I use, we use a kind of interactivity that doesn't use any sticks, like joysticks. It doesn't use teleportation. It doesn't use clicking or like anything, you know, it's like very uh, seamless because it meant, it's meant to feel like a human experience, but it's completely driven by interactivity. That's just like, and it's hidden and that's by design. Um, so I'd say it depends on what you're building. I know that's not maybe a great answer, but I would start with the end goals first and then work backwards and, and design from, from there. Um, so I hope that answers and, uh, your question a little bit. Yeah, uh, cool. uh, yeah, go ahead, Alessandro, yeah. Right, so, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. It's, it's, it's very hard to like define like what, what immersion mean. Like there's, there's obviously like, like we can understand it from the point of view of like like this kind of like recreation or like simulation of like hyper real world and like you know like this kind of like uh like how much can you tell the difference how much can you feel like like you're you're in another space um um for me like it's a matter also like uh, i mean like yeah on one hand you have like hyper real like recreation of a world that make you like feel like fully immersed fully there um and i think that that also happens with like very simple like old old games old projects that are very like low res graphics but that like they fully catch you and like you just can leave and like um but i, I think for me like an interesting um diversification is also like immersion and participation like i feel for example that like games like fortnite are like fully immersive like once you're there um 
to the point of like being addictive but they're not very participatory because there's nothing you can really add to the game there's no way you have agency over the game uh you're just like playing over and over um you know it, it can be the solution to all your problems like you can feel amazing like you can feel part of a community but you have no uh again you have no agency over the structure of the infrastructure of the world itself uh so for me it's it's um it's very important to, to think about interactivity and participation as a way of like creating tools for the people that play the game or that for the people that that there are like immersing themselves in a world to also give them the tools to govern and restructure that world um so that yeah so you don't end up with like uh like an authoritarian <laughs> a model of like again of like uh, creating work and having experience uh, to the people so yeah. yeah i guess like the the medium is really the message so if the medium is very rigid then you also kind of implicitly accept that you don't have a, a voice or a, like a part in in the building like collective building of meaning uh, together i would say but also this is very true that um, um, also with very, it's not automatic that high resolution means like higher immersiveness. And, and one example is that you can do so much with only with sound, for example, and uh, it can be even more, more powerful than, uh, than a very realistic uh, VR experience sometimes. So uh, we always have to, uh, it's, it's very nice to hear that also from very different backgrounds, you have Quite, quite similar questions about really going uh, zooming out and uh, and uh, trying to question every every element and every everything that not as a given but it's something that that you can intervene on uh, so yeah this is uh, really exciting to hear and uh, I unless there are more questions um, or something else you want to say about also about each other's work. Um, you're very welcome. I think there is someone typing. Um, if you have questions uh, for each other, otherwise we can uh, we can wrap it up and uh, continue um, offline or later on. Yeah, I, th I think I, I blab blabbered about a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it like. Mm. Um, yeah. No, you didn't. Uh, this was very, very interesting and inspiring. I hope it was all uh, for you as well. And yeah, it was uh, nice to participate. Yeah, yeah. Great. No, it's really nice to participate also in these like alternative like um, like events where there's like more voices, um, uh, more different voices speaking. Yeah. So. Thank you both again, and uh, yeah, good luck with your work, and uh, we hope to to have you again join the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank so you much. so much. Thank, Thank you, everybody, for coming yeah. here as well. Yeah.